Welcome and thank you for joining us at the conversation presented by the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany. My name is Paul Grandall. I'm the director of the Writers Institute. Before I introduce today's guest, C.M. Wagoner, uh, let me remind you that this and all of our author interviews are posted on the Writers Institute YouTube channel. And you can also find them at the conversation at our website, nyswritersinstitute.org. Please also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We also will post a link where you can purchase the author's book directly online from our local independent bookseller, Bookhouse of Stuyvesant Plaza. And if you wish to support future programming like this, you can make a donation as well at our website, nyswritersinstitute.org. We'd be very grateful for that. So now let me introduce CM Wagoner. She's a fast rising novelist and star in the fantasy genre who has published two novels in the past two years. Her debut novel, Unnatural Magic, came out last year and won critical praise. Wagoner was heralded as an enchanting new voice in fantasy. She won acclaim from fans and critics alike. Publishers Weekly called it, quote, a delightfully playful and a fresh take on traditional fantasy tropes to explore themes of love and sacrifice with whimsy, mystery, and vibrant characters sure to enchant readers. Wegener's second novel, published January 12th, just four days before we were recording this interview, is titled The Ruthless Lady's Guide to Wizardry. It tells the story of a down and out witch and a young gentlewoman who join forces against a deadly conspiracy. On her website, Wagner describes herself as, quote, a humble author for all of your wizard needs. In truth, she grew up in the Capital Region in a rural community where she spent a lot of time reading fantasy novels. She studied creative writing at SUNY Purchase, lived in China for eight years before moving with her husband to Albany. She likes to cook and garden and is a dog lover. I should also say, that's a special treat for me to be interviewing this author because I'm a friend of her father, Jeff Wagoner, former journalist and writer. He's a proud papa who'd been telling me for many, many years about his talented daughter, Caitlin, that she's going to make her mark as a novelist. It's a pleasure to be meeting my friend's daughter and thank you for joining us at the conversation. Do you mind if I call you Caitlin? I, I don't mind, that's fine. Thank you All so right. much for having me. Yes, well, thanks for being here. So. I'm interested in hearing how early did you either start reading fantasy novels or were they read to them? And what was it about this genre that drew you to it? Um, I, I honestly, um, I have a really early memory. One of my earliest memories of seeing, I'd seen this book sitting around my house that was my older sister's and I just been fascinated by the picture on the cover. It's this sort of mysterious looking picture of a woman with long black hair. And I have a memory of looking at it and suddenly realizing that I could read the title. Like I had this amazing power to understand what was going on in this image. Right. So it's, it's, as far as I can remember, it was a, a genre as I was reading probably as my older sister was reading it. Um, what was that book? Do you remember the? Uh, it, it was a book called Juniper by Monica Furlong. Uh, she has another book, another book that was sort of the companion or the the sequel to that called Wise Child, which is a bit more famous. But I loved both of those as a kid. That's both great. Really good. And, and I guess J.K. Rowling and the Harry Potter books came much later, and you don't really consider them an influence. I, I yeah, to to me that was. Uh, I think I think I was. 10 or 11 when when they came out and I read them but they were I'd already read so much other fantasy that it wasn't so much of a revelation to me and also I always tended to be a little bit more attracted to books that had girls as the main characters because I, I related to them a bit better right. so I loved um Diana Wynne Jones uh who wrote a ton of books over the years some of them uh her most famous is called Howl's Moving Castle it was made into an, an anime a Miyazaki movie so that's kind of a famous one. I loved uh, Tamara Pierce was one of my favorites. So she actually blurbed my book. First book was, which was this like incredible thing for me. And my mind is completely blown that she could have read the book because I loved her so much as a kid. So yeah, there's a ton that I read when I was little. That's great. I, I have to admit that that fantasy is kind of a gap in, in my reading background, but I know it's it's hugely popular. And, uh, you know, I, I want to learn more about it and, uh, I've been reading your newest book. It's got a beautiful cover. 
Yeah, I, lo I love the cover. The artist did an incredible Nicholas job. Lady's Guide to Wizardry. I like the title too, but let's let's talk a, a little bit about you know your your earliest um, you know beginnings as a writer. You went to Columbia High School. You grew up mm -hmm. out in Rensselaer County, I guess. Um, uh, did you take creative writing or did you write on the I literary did. journal I, at high school? I took a creative writing class. My teacher was Deborah Marinelli. She was great. She was one of the, the first people who read my stuff and sort of encouraged me to, to go keep on going with it. And I also, I attended the New York State Young Writers Institute one summer. That's oh, right. It was we also really, it was my first. With Skidmore, yes. We're yeah, happy. it was my, my first uh, like workshopping kind of experience. And that was really cool too. Um, it was great. It was my first time also interacting more with adults who were who are writers. It was like a great experience to have as a kid. Um, and then after I graduated from high school, I went to SUNY Purchase and attend, attended their creative writing uh, program major. It's it's not they don't count it as one of the conservatory programs at Purchase, but it functions fairly similarly. It's every year is. 25 students, I think, is, is how it was at least when I was there. So you have these really small, intense workshop classes that go on through all four years. That's great. Let, let's go back for a minute to the uh, Summer Young Writers uh, Institute mm -hmm. uh, up in Saratoga Springs, Skidmore. Like I've mentioned, we, we've co-sponsored that. My friend and colleague, Bill Patrick, is the founder and director. And I know students, young, young aspiring writers and students from around the country come to that. And it's kind of an intensive, what did that teach you when you saw other kids like you that had similar interests and, and this love of writing? What, what did that give you early on? I think um, it, one of the big things for me was it taught me or it helped me to really understand writing as more of a craft as opposed to, I think that like as a kid or whatever, you, and even a lot of adults who haven't done much writing, they tend to think of, you know, writers as being sort of these like, I don't know, wizards who have like an entire book just comes into their head and they transcribe it as opposed to it being this sort of, you know, like renovating a house or something else that takes a lot of work and you probably make a mistake and you have to go back and fix things. And it's like a lot of time and effort and energy. And also you need to learn to have the skills to do it. And so that was, I think that was one of the big things that got out of it. And also it was really fun for me to be this kind of weird kid, nerdy kid who loved to write stories to be around all these other weird nerdy kids who are into the same thing. Great. And what was the scene at SUNY Purchase like? Did you, was there some kind of creative writing journal club, something that you were- There were, there was, um, well, we, as the creative writing program, we had an annual, uh, I guess there was a, I don't remember, there was, there was, I'm gonna get these details wrong. Someone from Purchase is gonna contact you and be like, no, she has everything wrong. But there there was a, a creative writing club that published, uh, I think maybe quarterly, little kind of almost like zines or magazines um, that included student work. And then there was also one through the creative writing program that operated more like a, a contest where people would submit their uh, their work. I think they did both poet, poetry and short fiction and they published a certain number of them and they selected a couple for cash prizes. So I was involved with both of those. So you were pretty young when you sort of knew what you wanted to be. So many people, you know, spend their whole career kind of trying different things and not sure, or did you have another path? Was writing going to be the side gig or, or did you always want to be a full-time writer? Uh, I think like when I was really young, like really, like a really little kid, I hadn't quite settled on it yet. I, I think it was more like later. I, for a while, I wanted to be a film director, which is, I guess, sort of a similar kind of a thing to be interested in. Um, and then later in high school, I got interested in writing, but I'd always, I was always, I've always been sort of a practical minded person. So for a while, I thought, well, maybe I should get into publishing and then I can be around books, but not try to like make my living as a writer. But as time went on, I kind of realized that that that's not necessarily where I want to be either. So it, it kind of doing novels full time is just sort of what fell into place. Yeah. Now, when did you go to China and, and, and what were you doing there for eight years? Um... <laughs> so initially I just started when I was at Purchase, I wanted to learn a, a language basically just because I, you know, I'd heard that it's, it's good for your brain, you know, everyone should learn a language. And I initially, uh, I would have been considering double majoring in history and I thought I wanted to learn Latin. And then I found out that uh, they didn't have it on campus and I'd have to like take a bus to another like nearby 
college. I thought, oh, I don't want to do that. You know, I had to get up really early. So I, <laughs> I checked my other options. I saw that uh, there was Chinese 101. And I thought, well, that sounds like like that could be useful. A lot of people, there's a lot of, you know, more than a billion people who speak Chinese, why not? And so I took this intro course and I just fell in love with the language. So I continued studying it. I did a year immersive program in Beijing to, to do just Chinese language, uh, loved it. And then I, while I was, and I also did a, a summer program in Shanghai. While I was there, I met my now husband and, but the, even while I was doing my, my study abroad, I was thinking I wanted to stay in China more to get my Chinese up to a more fluent level. So I immediately after college, I got a job as an English teacher. Like I applied online, got the job and flew straight to Xi'an, which is a city out in the kind of more Western, upper Western part of China, not quite all the way to Tibet and Xinjiang, a little bit more Midwest. Uh, and I spent two years there teaching English before I got a job uh, at the German Chamber of Com Commerce in Shanghai. And so we moved there. And it was it was really great. It was great being in China and my Chinese did get pretty good. So, <laughs> so this is Mandarin, I assume. Then. Yeah, yeah, I speak Mandarin and a little bit of a couple of other dialects that I picked up from like friends. My, my husband speaks Shanghainese as his first language, but we speak Mandarin together at home. Great. And um, what were the benefits or upside of those years in China, in addition to immersing yourself in this language and culture? Um, did it make you want to write uh, fiction more? Did it, did it um, you know, open your horizons to, to new ideas and thoughts? Or what, what did it give you? Yeah, I think for me, at least, the, the value of having lived somewhere else is that it makes you more more observant of the world around you and more observant of your own biases and things because it takes you out of a place where you can just sort of glide along assuming that you know how things are supposed to go and how like what what's normal or whatever it makes it makes you see everything in a a new way i don't think I think sometimes think people think that, you know, you're, they're gonna take a trip to whatever country and then they're gonna learn, they're gonna understand the culture and then they can write about it. But I, after eight years in China, I still feel like I couldn't really write about China in a way that would be particularly convincing to Chinese people, but I can write about uh, the feeling of being in a different culture or I can write about uh, the experience of realizing that something that you would assumed is always true is actually just what you're used to. So I think it was very helpful in kind of helping me to look at things in different ways, which is really useful when you're writing fiction. I saw that you like to cook. It mentioned in, on your bio, your website. Did you learn to cook Chinese cuisine and do you still? Uh, well, so my husband's a really good cook. So most oh, of the Chinese good. food in our house is, is him, but I, I did learn to do some stuff. His mom was very into teaching me how to, to cook some things. Uh, usually like last night we made dumplings together. He makes, he makes the filling and I do the folding. So we're a good team. Nice. So how, how did you meet there? Was he a writer too? Or, or No, we actually, I, when I was doing my study abroad in Shanghai, he just happened to attend. He was a, a student at the university that we were at and, uh, he, a friend of mine had, was unsuccessfully trying to cash a check at this bank that my husband, it was in an internship, the intern ad at the time. And so my husband helped my friend out and my friend invited him to come out, hang out with us. And that's how we met. It's a complete coincidence. Wow. And, and when did you come back to Albany? Uh, it was 2017 is when we came back. Okay. So it's been three, yeah, but just almost four years. It was January 2017. How does time work? <laughs> it's we've been back for a while now. You or I've been back. Anywhere you want, time. any way you want in a fantasy novel. <laughs> but anyway, exactly. Um, let me um, ask you. So you left about three years ago. I've been reading a lot about President Xi's crackdown, the surveillance, the, the you know the uh, the uh, lack of human rights and, and silencing critics. Were you feeling any of that? Did you experience any of, of this downside of, of um, you know, a, an authoritarian country and it, something it, that we, we lapsed into over the last four years as yeah. well? And today was inauguration day, so it's a new day in America. But anyway, did you, did you experience any of that dark side of China, which, which is, exists? I know that. You know. Right. Um, I... 
So as a foreigner, you tend to be very insulated from that sort of thing. You're very, you're very privileged as a, a foreign person, particularly as a white foreign, foreign person in China. You have a lot of leeway to kind of do what you want. But you did see that sort of stuff seeping in. I was, I was friends with some artists in China, some local Chinese artists, and it was really difficult for them because they, they felt like, you know, in a, in a place where your, your art has to be kind of politi like politically correct in like the kind of old fashioned sense where you really, there really are like rules about what you're allowed to make. Um, it, I think at a certain point, it's almost like not even worth the effort for them. They feel like to try to make other stuff. They just sort of slip into, I had one friend who, he was a sculptor and he wanted to make what he thought were like interesting sculptures, but you know, along with the normal pressures of being an artist and trying to make a living, he ended up making a lot of sort of Western style angel statues for cheap hotel lobbies, that kind of, yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. And then I also, I did experience some kind of uh, scarier stuff when we were traveling around the further west of China, closer to Tibet. Like at one point we, we were traveling out there and we got stopped in a, a roadblock where these soldiers went through all of our cameras and made sure we weren't journalists. So you do see that sort of thing creeping along the outside, but as a as a white foreigner living in China, you kind of get to float along doing your own thing. Maybe you complain about how, like you can't go on Facebook or you can't use whatever website because of the firewall, but it's it's definitely easy to not pay attention to that sort of thing until you really start talking to local people who are involved in the arts or involved in politics and hearing what they have to say. I'm sure the suppression has accelerated in the past three years. Yeah, it, things things change all the time there. That like it's it's kind of hard sometimes to keep track of what's going on. And also, most you know most people in China are just sort of you know doing their own thing. They have a job, they have a family, so they're not necessarily constantly like it, you know that sort of stuff creeps up on you slowly. And if you've lived in an environment your entire life where free speech isn't such a thing, you're not necessarily thinking about it all the time. So it's the way that people experience that is really different person from person to person too. Um, what brought you back? Were you homesick at all? Was your visa up? I mean, what, what decided to leave? What sounded like a, a pretty nice eight years? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I really missed my family. Like no matter how much you want to be able to come home and see people often, like the reality of a, a sometimes $2,000, 15 hour flight is, <laughs> is a lot to do. Um, and because the, the politics in China, sometimes like thinking long-term, like how will I be able to stay here long-term? What happens when we have a kid? Um, even little kind of minor things like the air quality often being extremely bad. It's something that when you're first there, you're just sort of like, well, this is kind of novel and wacky, but long-term you start thinking about like, what well, is this gonna be bad for my health? Would this be bad for a kid's health? Um, so yeah, I just, it sort of felt like time to maybe come here and just feel out how we felt about being here instead. Okay. So I want to turn to this, your, your new novel, novel, and it's really hot off the press. I appreciate yeah. taking time. It's just been out for a couple of days. The Ruthless Lady's Guide to Wizardry. The, the protagonist, Delaria, she goes by Delhi. She's really sassy and kind of a badass and funny and dark and profane. There's a lot of F-bombs in the book. <laughs> There's a lot of sex and, and um, but she's also sad. Her, her mother's an alcoholic. She's, she's uh, gonna be evicted. She's behind on her rent. She sometimes prostitutes herself, you know, and she needs money in this, in this fantasy world. Why did you want to write it as fantasy and not straight up fiction when you're dealing with really contemporary issues, I think, in, in this kind of fantasy guide. Why, why this genre to tell these kind of heartbreaking backstories in a way? I think sometimes, um, well, I just love the freedom of fantasy. I think people who aren't so involved in the in the genre, they think of fantasy as, a, as having more rules than like straight fiction. But I think of it as having less because like, you know, if I wanted to write a character who's I don't know, a politician in the real world, I would have to make sure that everything that happens is like strictly abiding by what could feasibly happen in a very specific time of place in our world. And in fantasy, I have more room to kind of play with these concepts and put them in different contexts and see how it looks like when it's taken out of sort of like what I was talking about, like the, the experience of having lived somewhere else where it sort of lays bare these like assumptions you have about the way that things 
just are or the way that they should be. I think that it can be really fun to put this sort of thing into a fantasy context and see if well, like, how, how does this read if it's not kind of surrounded by all these sort of like assumptions that we're making about the way that things normally are? Like what right. can you, what new stuff can you find in, in your world by looking at like a person who could be in this world but is instead in another one? We mentioned before, you know, the sort of time shifting, time bending. I can't really place what time this is supposed to be. There's times where it feels like Elizabethan England and people are kind mm -hmm. of talking in Shakespeare-esque language, but then, you know, she answers a one ad and there's, you know, really kind of modern language and uses. Is that anything goes, you know, you can jump around and, and whereas and wherein and forsooth and then you know, <laughs> drop an f-bomb or a sort of a hip-hop uh, syntax you know or, um i think you know because it's you know in another world it's to an extent it's anything goes but what i do try to do so like in this particular setting um i try to keep the technology level around uh mid 1800s so you can have you can have a gun or a train but you don't have a telephone or email um, just so that people don't like, I, I like it's important. I think in any fantasy setting, one of the things that fantasy writers think about a lot is as the reader is reading, you want them to after a while as they get used to the setting, have a pretty strong sense of what is and isn't possible because like, just because things are happening that wouldn't be possible in our world, you don't want them to read through 200 pages where, you know, there's dragons but also you can't bring people back from the dead and then all of a sudden have someone come back from the dead because that makes you go like, wait a second, like this seems made up. You, know, you want, you want the, the universe that you're in to have like rules that work for itself. So I, I the, the time period, it's the time periods, I guess it's mostly drawn from would be like the Victorian era around there. Yeah. That was our dog Lily here shaking her head. She's always just off camera. Hopefully she won't bark at passing uh, <laughs> delivery people. But um, I'm also interested in, in her as a character. She, she's really kind of wounded and fragile, but she's really strong and, and tough. And, and yet she gets her heart broken, you know, romantically and things. What, was there a certain inspiration for that character or is it made up out of whole cloth jelly? I, mean, I, th I think she's she's made up she's not inspired by any particular person but um I think that the way she is and acts feels at least to me pretty accurate to um the way a lot of people are who grew up in tough situations or yeah have struggled a lot maybe have lived in poverty that that sort of thing where like maybe they you can be very sort of savvy and capable of taking care of yourself but then still you know be a a human being who is you know gets sad and like can be hurt by other people or whatever like just because she's very adapted to surviving in her environment but she still has a lot of things she struggles with and some of the ways in which she's adapted are kind of maladaptive like they're not really what what she needs to be a happy person long term right i i think you know, the most basic writing advice, I'm sure you've heard it a lot, I, I've given it is write what you know, but mm -hmm. in the fantasy world, you're probably drawing on personal experiences, which all novelists does, but then you, you, you sort of vaulted into this other world. How do you either research or draw on your own experience or, or do you not at all when it's pure fantasy? I think that you, you do do research about stuff in terms of things like, um, like, does it make sense that a culture that does X, Y, Z thing would also do this other thing? And so you can kind of check out a bunch of different historical time periods or cultures and see whether or not that feels like it's something that would ring true. So like, for instance, in my first book on natural magic, I had kind of like a running joke about how the main, one of the main characters grew up in a town where the like the thing it's known for is that there's a bunch of pencil eraser factories there. And so then I had to double check to see if it made sense that like there could be a pencil eraser factory in a in a culture where trains are still relatively new. Like, does that ring true? Or do I have one thing that's uh, like a piece of technology from the middle ages next to something that's a piece of technology from the early 20th century. And there's no real rules with that. It's just, it's like this sort of, as a fantasy novelist, you're kind of engaging in this prolonged 
like game with your readers where you're, where you're kind of saying like, how about this? Do you buy that? And the reader's like, yeah, okay, I buy that. And you're like, well, how about this thing? And you want to continuously keep on kind of offering these things and hoping that they're going to be like, yeah, okay. That from what you've told me so far, that, that tracks, I can accept that. And when you're, you know that you're failing in your, in your world building, if halfway through the novel, you do something and you have readers feedback saying like, you know, this all made sense until all of a sudden these dragons showed up and no one had mentioned dragons previously. And I don't really believe that there should be dragons here. Right. I, I assume, I know what happens to mystery novelists. I assume because I know fantasy readers are, are a really committed group. They're voracious readers, but I imagine you get, emails and they call you out on that kind of thing right like 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 continuity in films like wait a minute he wasn't wearing that that scarf two scenes ago or something do people respond oh, yeah that, that, I, it hasn't been so many emails so far though i did get one just the other day that that called me out on what they thought was an error but like, uh, yeah, <laughs> i'm not i didn't even look back stuff. to check he's like I, I i at this point it's out of my hands it's already been published <laughs> like, I'm, yeah. I'm very sorry <laughs> I am but mortal. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you'll see that in reviews and things. They'll, they'll say, uh, in, in fantasy, it's not so much you made a mistake, but more like, I don't buy this world building. Like, it doesn't make sense to me that this person says this, but that person says that. It doesn't seem like they're, uh, it doesn't seem to me like two people from the same world should be behaving in these ways. But then a different reader might see that and go like, oh no, I did buy that because this person comes from, X social class or culture, or whatever, and that person is something different. So of course they disagree. So it's it's less about technical accuracy and more about whether or not it feels like it. This could be a universe that could exist. Right, and these are known as standalones, right? You don't envision these as series, like a lot of fantasy have long groups of titles all related to a certain yeah I, I i wrote two books these two books are in the same universe um but i don't i'm not a real my way of thinking about stories doesn't really lend itself to these long series because um they're not the books don't really have world ending stakes uh it's they're, they're kind of smaller more personal stories about uh, that are more character driven so i i was actually asked with the when I was talking to different publishing companies about the first book, one of the editors who was interested wanted it to be expanded into a series. And I ended up, I just said no, because I didn't, I didn't have a vision for these characters that they would continue going out and having these adventures. Like I thought that that's basically what, like, I'm sure they have other interesting things that happened in their life, but they're just a, a couple of people who stumbled into this particular scenario and I don't think they're going to become professional crime fighters or anything right it, for two of the main characters essentially it didn't really make especially it didn't make that much sense to me to go for that so so what, I write what, I write kind of smaller books what is the the story of of getting uh your first novel published uh, I mean was it a lot of rejection did it sort of happen easily was it some great stroke of luck T tell us how getting your first one published was it was a lot of luck I had like a series of lucky breaks um I met my my previous agent I recently changed agents because my my previous agent decided she wanted to pursue a different career path so I've, I recently switched but uh she found me via the internet she had seen kind of some like jokes and things that I was posting online and she thought it was funny and I had uh, mentioned that I was looking for a literary agent on this website. And so she contacted me and said, you know, send me what you got. She read it. She really liked it. Um, I, she became my agent and then she shopped it around, you know, as agents do. And I ended up with a few different offers for that first book. So it was a, a weirdly seamless kind of a <laughs> right. process. I, I didn't have to struggle much. So I always kind of feel bad when I talk about it because because uh, I, I think it was purely luck. It wasn't like there's was something wonderfully special about me. I just happened to on the internet run into someone who really liked my book and worked hard to sell it. I think your humor is, is, is your strongest uh, you know, attribute as a novelist. It, it's very funny, witty, um, clever, uh, but also sometimes just really flat out funny. Who, who are your influences in terms of that? Do you, watch a lot of stand-up comics or is it more from reading other fantasy writers or oh, i mean uh I, in terms of fantasy writers I, I love terry pratchett um i read a lot of terry pratchett as a kid and uh 
oh gosh, what's his name? The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Oh, yeah. I read that. Douglas as a kid. Adams. Yeah, Douglas Adams. I was like, something Douglas. Um, and um, P.G. Woodhouse is one of my yeah, like funny. number ones. I just I love him. Uh, so yeah, I, I read in a bunch of different genres. I actually don't at this point in my life. I don't read so much fantasy. I read a ton of it as a kid, and now I still read it, but um. I get a little bit paranoid that I'm going to accidentally like crib stuff from other writers. So I tend to, re I've been reading a lot of classics, a lot of nonfiction. I recently read this, this book that has been getting a lot of press. Uh, my, my sister, the serial killer. I don't know if you've heard of that. I haven't but heard of that. No. It was, it's this, you know, it kind of does what it says on the tin, but it's this wonderful, very short novel by a kind of like a sort of a thriller, I guess, by a, I think she's Nigerian author, but it was fantastic. I really liked that. Great. And um, so you, you've got two done. Are you already working on a third? Or are you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the third is actually not, I don't know if it's, if it's really right. Okay. So right now the book that I think that is going to be my next full size novel, um, I don't know if it even counts as fantasy. I don't, I guess no. Um, it's like a completely different thing set in the real world. There are some fantastic elements but I think it's, it's, I guess, kind of the, the hook that I've been saying is that it's as if the main character of a cozy mystery series realized that there's something deeply wrong about the number, sheer number of murders that are occurring around her and that she sets out to figure out, to figure out what, what on earth is going on. So I'm kind of working on playing around with some different genres. Right. And, and what is the uh, overlap in your mind between fantasy and magical realism? I think of the novels of Garcia Marquez or Borges or even our founder, William Kennedy. You know, it's going along in, in, in total realistic and then a ghost will pop up and, and some other supernatural or unnatural things will occur. In your novel, you know, Delhi, uh, you know, this guy's getting too fresh with her. She works as a bartender. Will light his beard on fire, or you know, somebody will give pustules to somebody. Is that go over the line of magical realism, or that fit of magical realism? Do you think? Um, I, honestly, I mean, I don't. I don't think my books would generally be considered magical realism because they're not set. And they're they're very clearly set in a different world. But at a certain point, I think there is no line, and sometimes the line between like fantasy and magical realism or what they call them speculative fiction. I honestly think it's almost more like um, one of them is considered genre and therefore kind of like low quality or, or bad or for, for silly people. And the other one has been given the stamp of approval by the, the very smart people in the know. I, I think that often, like sometimes you'll see someone who was considered very much fantasy by the fantasy community, getting a lot of recognition from mainstream press and all, all of a sudden they're being referred to as a writer of speculative fiction. Right. So, so I think that it's there's very, no real clear line there. Um, in at the, if you really, if I had to make a distinction, I would say that if, if it's mostly stuff that could happen in your normal life with some things that couldn't, then maybe that's more uh, magical realism. And if it's mostly stuff that couldn't happen in your real life with some such that and some stuff that could, then maybe it's fantasy, but it's, there's no then, real. Then we also sort of merge into science fiction. It's all about, yeah. thank God there's still bookstores, but they like to, you know, shelve things by categories readers and, 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 and consumers want to come in and sort of, that's my category. So you think they would, I mean, they put you with fantasy, I assume. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely, um, in terms of like the actual like bookshelf kind of designation, I'm adult fantasy. Yeah. Although people always think that I'm uh, YA, I guess because I'm a, a youngish woman writing fantasy and the covers are pretty. So they think I'm writing for for 12 year olds, which is, you know, it's great. I'm, well, there's a lot of really talented YA writers writing really great books, but it's not my genre. There's a lot of, as you noted, there's a lot of bad words. So yeah. don't give it to your children. <laughs> yeah, I would say you're definitely an R, you're not a PG-13. Yeah, yeah, and I, I feel terrible about it. I actually, I've sometimes gotten um, 
bad reviews on like by readers online who are saying that like this was not a this is not appropriate for children. I'm, like, I'm, I'm very sorry if you inflicted this on some innocent young child. I think parents aren't aren't hip to what their kids hear on the school bus starting in like third grade. Or yeah, something. yeah. Um, but uh, it strikes me too that you're sort of a, a a time traveler. I don't know if you would love to live in, in you know, a previous century or, or were you ever part of, there's this group in the area, the Society of Creative Anachronism, yeah. I think. Are you familiar? I've, I've actually- Yeah, I'm, I'm a, yeah my, my older sister was sort of into that stuff. And so I, I was I, wondering, do you, do you like that kind of role play or cosplay they call it or, or the Fanticon world? I've, I've never been one for dressing up. <laughs> and I'm not a big, I'm not a big costume person. Uh, I think I do, I really, like, I love a lot of Victorian lit, but, um, you know, if I'm, you know, realistically, like, practically, I don't think I'd have a really great time in any of those previous eras. Like, it was, you know, it was tough to be a woman. You, you know, the, you could die of all sorts of unfortunate diseases. Like, I, I think I'm pretty lucky to be born in this era, but, in like, I do really enjoy uh, reading books that were written in, like, a long time ago. Like, I... Right now I'm in the middle of the Pickwick papers, which is a lot of fun, <laughs> but uh, yeah, like I, I, I think I'm really interested in different time periods, but I, I don't necessarily want to want to live in them. And I'm not, I, like I said, I'm not really so much into like the trying to recreate those other time periods, but I like visiting them via, via books. And, and what, what is your writing practice? Are you a daily, very methodical, you know, trying to get a certain number of word or pages. Are you squeezing it around other jobs and things? I, I know, you, what else are you doing? You've got another job right now too as well. Yeah, right? I've been working for Yelp recently. I just got a, a job and that's, that's been really fun. It's been, it's good. It's been really cool is that to writing, have something. Is that writing copy or reviews or something? Uh, I'm, I'm something they call a community ambassador, which means that I like a uh, arrange events and that kind of thing right now it's a little bit weird because of covid but it's it's a very kind of social kind of job where you're doing a lot of engaging with the public which is really nice because you know as a writer you you, end, you kind of end up turning into this weird little cave gremlin gremlin that's just like on your own, right. on your own typing <laughs> so it's cool to have a, a counterbalance with a job that gets me like talking to people um so yeah and when i'm when I'm on a deadline, I really do have to be very disciplined. I tend to like, I'll, I'll figure out how much I have to write and how much time I have. And I'll sign myself a, a daily word count. And every day I uh, will sit down and write that. Before COVID hit, I really prefer to do that in public. Like I would take myself every day to a coffee shop and write for a certain amount of time or a certain amount of words, because it's nice to kind of have like, a, like an office you can go to. Right. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how, as I work on this new book, how, how well I do without that escape hatch. So the Ruthless Lady's Guide to Wizardry um, is just out. It it's, comes out a year after your first novel, A Natural Magic. I assume this was already written or did you write all of this in one calendar year? Uh, I pretty much wrote it in a in a year. <laughs> yeah. How, how okay. many words is it? It's got to be a hundred thousand or eighty thousand or. Oh, um, I think it's a hundred and ten or twenty. I don't remember exactly how much this one is. Fantasy novels tend to be longer, like as a rule, just because you need extra space to to explain all of the <laughs> dragons. I keep on talking about dragons. There's no dragons in the book, <laughs> but you need, you need a little bit of extra space to establish the setting. Um, I think historical fiction is similar, but yeah. Um, so you can, I mean, 340 pages or so. So that's page a day. Is that the kind of you just hit that yeah, pace and you don't about get about 500 to 750 words per day? I think is my my goal usually, which doesn't seem that much when you're. In, when you hear that, when you see 500 words in a page, it doesn't seem like that much, but some days it definitely feels like a, lo a lot more. <laughs> and how, how uh, good are you on the first draft? Or are you multiple drafts and the first draft is just really kind of an outline or do you write pretty clean the first draft or? Uh, I think I tend to overwrite. Well, it, I guess it depends. Um, I, as a writer, I'm, I really enjoy, like I'm, I'm not great with plots. As the readers will attest, I'm, <laughs> I tend to, I tend to get into the weeds. Like things will get slow, or um, 
there won't be like the, it's not like nonstop action usually. So I'll, I'll tend to write too much of the characters like sitting around and talking to each other that then has to get cut out. Um, and then often I'll have to, after the first draft, go back and like add in extra stuff to make the plot hold together more. Like maybe there's too many logical leaps or, you know, like there's not enough build up to something happening. So that it tends to be that kind of thing. I think the, I try to write, I tend to edit as I, I go. So I think the prose tends to be relatively clean, but uh, there's often <laughs> issues with things like the pacing. Yeah, I would say your wordplay and your 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 level of language is 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 what drives it, you know, more than the 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 plot twists and things. I also, in your acknowledgments, you know, you mention uh, an editor and and how much input does an editor have? Does an editor help you pare things down and fill in those missing gaps? Oh, yeah. My my editor at Penguin Jess is really great at kind of calling out my my excesses. She's <laughs> she's the one who like I I've Who's so far I've, again. What's her name? I forget. Her name is Jessica Wade. Okay. Um, I've you know worked on two books with her so far, and both times you know like I've submitted this thing, and I thought maybe she won't notice <laughs> whatever nonsense I'm hoping to get away from, and she she inevitably notices whatever whatever nonsense I have in there that isn't really working, um, and she'll tell me to either cut it or change it or like this needs fixing, that kind of thing. So she yeah. she's she's good at reining me in. <laughs> That's great. So I'm wondering. Um... Can you read a little selection to give us a little flavor? Um, <laughs> I, I should have I should have mentioned. I hope you have one close I, at hand. I do. I have I have actually a box of copies they sent me the other day that I've yet to put away. Do you have a passage in mind, or I I don't know. Whatever you like. I mean, the beginning is nice. I I love your chapter titles. You you know, each chapter always starts with a with a interesting flourish but maybe just the beginning I don't know kind of sure yeah I can I can read like the first page or so hold on one second yep. sorry I threw you a curveball there I should have uh, <laughs> but it's yeah, always nice to hear a little bit in the author's own voice okay how about I just do um the first paragraph or so. Yeah. I don't have any water nearby. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so chapter one, wherein Delaria hunts about for a wayward relation, is not the recipient of maternal warmth, and is presented with an opportunity for gainful employment. Delaria Wells had dis misplaced her mother. That what maybe wasn't so accurate to be very fair to herself, which Delhi preferred to be. To be very fair to Delaria, she didn't have to, have to do much to replace her ma'am. Her ma'am had a way of mis misplacing herself, like a cat who'd dart for freedom if you let the kitchen door open. But it had been two weeks now, and even as grisly an old cat as Deli's ma'am ought to have gotten hungry and come home after a fortnight of roaming. Something had gone wrong then, and as dreadful as her ma'am might be, it made t Deli's stomach take disagreeable turns to think that she might be sleeping in a garbage pile somewhere. Delhi, curse her eyes, was going to have to do something about it. Thank you. The <laughs> book is The Ruthless Lady's Guide to Wizardry. It's just out now, um, and we will have a link to uh, how people can buy it. Maybe you'll have some local book signings when that's allowed. Um, we really appreciate this. I, one thing I wanted to ask and I'll call you Caitlin again, since I know your father. Um, <laughs> the CM Wagoner, is, is that a, a nod to a certain author or is it because, you know, women are, are you know, want, want to, uh, I don't know, not put their, their, their name out there or, or what, what is? It's, it's not, uh not inspired by anyone in particular, I, more just that I like the idea of having like a firm line between uh, this is what I'm doing as an author, like having a special name for like what I'm doing as an author. And that's so it, so, you know, like if people are trying to search for me on the internet, they're not accidentally finding like my personal Facebook page or like something about when I was working at some company 10 years ago, it's just in terms of practicality of finding the work, which isn't a very romantic explanation. <laughs> okay. So, so you just use C.M. Wagner for your novel writing, but you know, in the rest of your world, you use your regular name. Yeah, I just use my, my, my normal name for anything that I'm doing that isn't like my fiction or writing work. 
I didn't know if it was J.K. Rowling esque or uh-huh. something like that. And there's, there's been there's a bunch of there's a bunch of people who have done that, but I, I just think it's nice to have like the like if one, someone's looking specifically for my work as a writer, that's what they'll find. And they also uh, my my real name is also shared by a woman who I believe was a Buffalo Bills cheerleader or something like that. So you know, you don't, oh, yeah. <laughs> that might lead the very astray. <laughs> so C.M. Wagner, I'm the only, I'm the only one that I'm aware of. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you, uh, C.M. Wagoner. Uh, hmm. Once again, a Ruthless Lady's Guide to Wizardry. It's a lot of fun. It's, it's laugh out loud funny. And, it, and it's also um, very sassy and spicy in places. And, <laughs> and, uh, it wants you to, makes you want to turn the pages. So I really appreciate joining the conversation. Wish you great luck and thank you very much. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. <laughs>